you people know, I have been coloring wood for quite a while. Um, as Mark just said, it's a total crapshoot. Um, you just don't know what you're going to get a lot of times. So what I have done is a uh, couple of things. Number one, uh, I use a number of different products from different companies. And what one product turquoise is in chestnut stains is a totally different color in the Horton stains. So I have made a cheat sheet. So this is on a white background and it shows the true color of all my individual colors. And it's very important because your base of your piece is also going to affect the color of this as well. So you got to have a starting point somewhere. So this is my starting point. Um, in addition to that, I have this lovely little brochure that came from the Mixall Paint Company that they do. Uh, uh, Woodcraft carries a bunch of, uh, of uh, colors that can be uh, used to mix in your epoxies and so on and forth, so forth. This tells you all of those colors and what proportions to use of all of their products. So you use 10 drops of this and 5 drops of that and whatever, and you can get to this color. So it really makes a difference if you really want to try to improve a color that you have or change a color that you have. Because a lot of times you're taking a, a base color and you want to modify it, and your modifiers are generally white to make it lighter or a complementary color that's going to make it darker, all right? So in, this, in that particular instance, I always have test pieces. I like to mix test pieces, and I use this little tray to put my colors in, and the question is, is how or what's the best way to apply the colors? Well, it depends on what you're, you're coloring, whether you're dyeing a piece that's this big, you're not going to color it with a Q-tip, okay? You could, and you could paint all the little individual pieces in here. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, right. So I, I have used a number of things. This is a cosmetic sponge for applying uh, women apply makeup. So I buy a pack of these in the dollar store, and what they have is a much finer foam than you're going to find in a foam brush. So consequently, you don't get streaking like you would get in a foam brush. They're cheap. They're throwaway. When you're done, they're gone. Um, the other thing that I like to use is... You know, everybody's got that whole bag of T-shirts that's sitting around their house. T-shirts are great, okay? Cut them up in a little patch so that you can make a pad, and you're only using the very corner so that you can paint your, your stain on, all right? Do not use a paper towel, all right? Most paper towels have patterns on them. And unless you want that pattern to come through on your piece, do not use a paper towel. Okay? It's just not worth it. The other thing that I do when I'm looking for a specific pattern is this is a sea sponge. And I'll buy, over at Michael's, I'll buy a couple of sea sponges and I'll cut them up and this will give you the pattern of the opening of the sponge. All right? So, there's a number of different ways to color things. You can color things as a global color, just like a couple of pieces that we had over there today. I am not doing that technique. That's great if you have a piece that's uniform or a piece that has tremendous figure in it because the, the dyes are absorbed in a figured piece much differently 
depending on hardness, softness of the adjacent wood. So for instance, this piece, if I were to dye this, this is a classic piece that you would use a technique where you put on a base, and the base is generally a dark color, and then you sand it away, and then you put on a top color, and what happens is, is where you put on your first color, it has been absorbed in the softer wood, and then you sand that away, and so the highlights would be the harder wood in this. And it makes a very interesting piece. But unless your piece has that distinction with hard and soft woods, that is not a good technique because it just it goes muddy. You, j you put on one color, you put on the next color, and all it does is mask whatever you put on the first time. So you have to sand that first color away. And I don't know how many people have worked with honey locust. I do not want to sand this any more than I possibly have to. It is hard as all. So this one will not get colored. Now, this, there's, there's a number of pieces up here. This would be an ideal piece for coloring. It's got a little variation in the, the natural color of the wood. This is a piece of cherry. Um, and it would be an ideal piece for coloring. This piece, don't even think about putting color on a dark piece. It just, it will not highlight anything. It will not accent anything. Do not even, don't waste your time. Okay? So, with this piece, for instance, this has, this is a piece of uh, Chinese filbert. And this is, this will be dyed because it has so much variation in the grain structure, in the coloring structure, that it's just going to become a really highlighted piece. All right? Now, this piece, this is also going to be dyed. All right? And I will do a, a technique on this where, first of all, this is spalted wood. If I put alcohol inks or alcohol dyes on this wood, it's going to soak. The wall thickness is about 3 16 of an inch. It will go from the inside all the way to the outside. It will soak right through, especially on the end grain. So on a piece like this, this will be sealed before I put on any colorant. And I seal it with the Zinzer product. This is a, a shellac-based product. And it seals that so that it stops that weeping all the way through the piece. Okay. It, yes. And the reason it takes the color is because Zinzer, shellac, is alcohol solvent. Okay. It will, and that's a big point, because if it's not alcohol solvent, it doesn't do the same thing. So if you put on your zinser and then you put on a color, the zinser has to be dry, and then you're adding your color, and you want to be very judicious about how you add your color, because you can solvent that first coat off, and it'll, it'll bleed through. Okay? Yeah, go ahead. That's the de-waxed one, correct. This one? Uh, what, this one? <laughs> Probably not, because th what I'm going to do on this one is the inside and outside will be the same color. So uh, that's my thoughts, anyhow. Um, and the difference is that, for instance, the inside of this I plan on coloring yellow, okay? When you're coloring the way I color things, you start with the lightest color first, and then you add darker colors. When you do a piece that requires the color to be sanded, you start with the darkest color first and move to a lighter color. And that's a big distinction. So on this one, for instance, if I start with yellow on the inside 
and yellow on the outside. I will probably add a blue on the outside and create a green on this outside. But because the yellow has been applied on the inside already, it's not going to bleed. Okay? If I was worrying about bleeding, I can also seal it once again, even after I've had the first coat on, because the Zinsser being an alcohol-based you know, solvent, I can put it over a color. I can put it over a stain. Okay? So, again, it's, it's layers and knowing that, you know, yellow and blue make green. You know, uh, red and blue make purple. But y you have to sort of get a feel for each individual color and how it's going to mix. And on my cards here, there's some of them that I have. I have color mixes that I've, I've added to just so that, you know, you can have an idea of these two color mixed together, that's what it's going to create. Okay? That's the technique that I use. Of uh, uh, I I I don't I don't bleed it through a thin bowl. I bleed it on the surface, and that's how my technique differs from a lot of things that you're going to see on the internet. Um, what I do is I will apply a color, a base color, for instance, to this. This was done in a orange base color. And then over top of that, I added a red and solvent it with the alcohol so that it creates a, an edge pattern. It creates a, a very unique pattern. I'm going to pass this around just so you can sort of see. When I was doing my homework on alcohol inks, I found out that they are, um, they are used to paint glass. They're used to paint, you can paint alcohol ink on a piece of ceramic, okay? So this piece of ceramic is my, is my test balloon a lot of times. So I'll take my colors, I will put down a base, I'll put down a top color, and then see how they're, they're mixing. But they mix in such a way that the top color solvents the under color. So I can take that first color and I can make it totally disappear by putting too much on the second color. I can create an edge by putting the second color over the first and putting a lot of color on and having it run. Okay? So it's a technique where you really taking a piece that does not have a lot of character, that finial on that piece is a white piece of maple. It just had no, no life to it at all. So I wanted to enhance that. So that's what I do with some of my coloring. This piece, again, is going to be another piece that will be, it will be colored because it just has nothing in terms of grain that is of all that interest. So this is going to be hollowed and then mounted in a forest of porcupine quills going up the side. So that's on the plate. So the th other things that I use for, for coloring are these are pens that I can load ink in one has a very fine tip on it, okay? I can do high detail with this. So I can take this piece and detail this rim and not have anything drip into the rest of the piece. And it really makes a big difference because a lot of people will tell you, okay, you color this and then you have to cut away the wood so that you don't, interfere with or don't get a drip or a run with this I can take that I'm not loading it too much it's a matter of squeezing this to distribute the the ink very controllable
piece. That one's hard because it, I didn't clean it well enough, okay? But no, it's not hard. This is the other style of tip, a nice broad tip, but a very soft bristle. So this will allow me to paint a piece and I don't get a lot of streaking with it. So for a, a, a little bigger, broader application, I like something like this. All these are through a paint company called Arteza. It's a, uh, a, a very good look on the web that if you wanted uh, to order them some stuff, they, they've got really nice stuff. So if you want, you can pass these around just so people have a, a sense of what those are. All right, so what I'm looking at, can you get that? It's a good spot? All right. So what I'm looking at is, the other thing is, I love these little measuring cups, you know, little little uh, pill cups, because they just, you know, if you put too much alcohol out at once, guess what? It dries up, okay? So let's just show you a technique associated with, with this. Now, a lot of people will say, um, take, your, take your ink and take a lighter and go poof and dry off the alcohol. Yep, there's a lot of things in your shop that have uh, things that don't really treat well or go well with, uh, with uh, a flame. So I like to use a heat gun. I'll dry it with a heat gun and it, it works fine. Okay, so what we have on this, as you can see, I just put this on and it's sort of just run. It's not a real thick fluid at this point, all right? If I, if I wanted to, I could take just some good old denatured alcohol and I could take that right off of there. Now, you can't do that if you have a wood that has not been sealed. You can do it with a wood that you have sealed, okay, which makes a big difference in what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish. So, you know, Mark was talking about, well, he didn't like the, the color that he got on there, and he ended up sanding it. Yes, I've ended up sanding stuff two and three and four times. It's no fun, okay? So I've now taken and wet my, my Q-tip, and I'm just going to dip that on there. And if you get a close-up, you see what the, what the color is doing? It's totally running away from the solvent. Okay? So I can use that to draw a, a spot, an area, on my piece. And that's what I did there. So I created a border, and then after I created a border... I put in a, another color, okay? So I can now take this, this red, and if I touch that in the center, I'm now able to, to color that as a highlight for the center, okay? And yes, it takes, it takes some time, but the amount that you put on there will determine if it runs to, you see how it's created an edge right here that is purple? It allows you to mix and match and do that on your wood as long as the wood is sealed. Okay? So, wh wh how does that translate? Well, this is a piece of, of wood that has been um, stabilized with, um, sure, what's the heat stabilized? Cactus juice. So this is, has been put in vacuum, cactus juice infused in it, and then it's just been sanded. The other thing that you will find out that if you are going to do any coloring, sandpaper until your fingers are raw. Um, if you don't sand, every scratch will be highlighted 
to the nth degree. You, you really have to prepare your piece absolutely or else it's just not going to happen. Uh, I do 400. I do, I've done 600. I don't think you need to do 600, but 400 for sure. Yeah. And most of the 400 is, uh, is hand sanding. I don't, I don't use a power sander for 400. So, for instance, this piece, I can now draw within those, those spalted lines. And the other thing that you will find out is that the spalting restricts the flow of alcohol ink. So if you're doing a spalted piece, I can do, I can color within the lines for this whole piece. It's, it's, you know, how well did you do in fifth grade? I don't know, you know. <laughs> okay. So, you know, you can, you can, you can really be creative with this technique of how it, it can be blended and, and sort of morphed into a different color. So the, the thing is, is it takes too long to do a full demonstration, so I'm really not going to do a full demonstration. But if anybody has any questions regarding that, I'll be glad to sit here and go through it with you. I'm sorry? Yes. Uh, there's a number of different products that you can bleach wood with. Uh, don't try regular bleach. Uh, oxalic acid works very well. They also have a two-part bleaching product that you can buy. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, works very well. Uh, some wood takes bleaching better than others. Um, but know that it's going to put a lot of moisture back in your wood. And after you bleach something, you need to let it dry again and you, you'll be sanding. It has raised the grain quite a bit. It will not go deep in a piece of wood. You're not going to you're not going to bleach a piece of wood a quarter of an inch thick and the whole thing will be bleached. You know, no. But if you wanted to do a surface, you can bleach a surface. You can do, right. 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 That was sealed, so it doesn't matter. Once you seal the, the wood, it acts as a homogeneous piece. And that's the difference with working with sealed wood versus non-sealed wood. I, I basically use a Scotch-Brite white pad. I don't get real aggressive with it. So, and then this piece was lacquered. So that, that color went on with the sealed finial and then it was spray lacquered. So uh, I, I don't touch it until I usually have two or three coats of lacquer on it and then I'll take a little, you know, little Scotch-Brite pad to it, usually the white or maybe the gray, uh, to just knock anything off and then try to go for my final coat. This is a sanding sealer, and it's already diluted, okay? So I can use that right out of the can. If you care to make your own shellac, you can use, uh, you know, a real uh, thin cut of shellac as a sealer as well. Um, I'm too lazy. <laughs> I use this right out of the can. That dries in 20 minutes easy. Yeah, and, and if it gets a little uh, hard, or not hard, but it gets a little thick, you can add a little uh, alcohol to it to thin it down. You really want it to soak in. You don't want a surface coat left on there much. You really are looking for it to soak in. Because what it's going to do is it's going to soak in the end grain a lot more than the face grain. So if I notice that 
there's really a big demarcation between the end grain and the face grain. I'll put a second coat on. Denatured. Denatured alcohol. Well, all alcohol has water in it. Okay, denatured alcohol tends to have less than rubbing alcohol. So, you know, you're going to raise the grain in wood if you're if you're wiping it with alcohol um, and it's not sealed. Be aware, you're going to raise the grain. So you want to you want to wipe it with alcohol, resand it to knock down any fuzz, and then put on your sealer. Any other questions? All right. So.